don't want to have to re re-record it. All right. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about finding area, volume, and all the things that go along with that. And so this problem right here, this is a non-calculator problem on an AP test. I'm not exactly sure what year this was. But you have f of x equals 2x squared minus 6x plus 4, and g of x is equal to 4 cosine of 1 fourth pi x. Let r be the region bounded by the graphs of f and g as shown in the figure above, or over to the side. Find the area of r. Okay, so now this is, you know, when I look at an area problem, I always think to myself, okay, it's top function minus bottom function. That's all it is. Okay, so my top function is going to be, what, 4 cosine? So this is going to be the integral of 4 cosine, 1 fourth pi x, um, minus the bottom function, which is 2x squared minus 6x plus 4. Now, as I said, this is not a calculator problem. So you really have to be able to do a little bit of work on this thing. Now, I would take that minus sign through here. So I would do the integral of 4 cosine of 1 fourth pi x minus 2x squared plus 6x minus 4. But I'm not going to. And what are we going from 0 to 4 or 0 to 2 here? I'm not going to do all of the, the calculating, um, but hopefully you are able to find the integral of this. Is that, am I talking to the right person, Caleb? Are you able to take the integral of that? Would you be able to? Yes, I could, I could take the integral. You split it up, and then you use u substitution for the first part, right? Nah, I don't think you'd have to use u substitution for the first part. Because isn't the integral, because I, the first, I would, the first part, like 0 to 2, I'd pull that 4 out. So then you have the cosine of 1 fourth pi x. Well, isn't the integral of cosine, um, if, I'm, if I'm thinking right, the integral of cosine, isn't that just um, sine of, okay, so if I'm thinking correctly, isn't this just the sine, oops, of one fourth pi x over one fourth pi? Wouldn't that be the integral of cosine one fourth pi x? Oh, yeah. yeah. And then the rest of these, I mean, heck, uh, that's just going to be minus 2x to the third over 3 plus 6x squared over 2 minus, I don't know, that was a 4, uh, 4x. So now, I mean, obviously, I've already taken the integral. So now you have to plug in the 2 and the 0, which... <laughs> Now, when you think about it, I mean, it's not it's not so bad. But let me let me write this out. So this was the sine of one fourth pi x over one fourth pi minus two x to the third over three plus, and then I'm going to just simplify this down to three x squared minus, was that last one, 4x? I think so. And we have to be able to plug in the values, 0 and 2. All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to plug 2 in there without using a calculator. Plug in 2 and tell me what you get for your value. Okay, and I'm going to plug 2 in also, and I'm going to see what I get for a value. Okay. I better... I better write it down on a piece of paper also. <laughs> I'll never be able to do it. All right, so I'm going to do this one. Um, so 2. Um, don't forget, doesn't the sine function have to be multiplied by 4 as well because you took that out at the beginning? Oh, yes, it does. Um, that does have to be multiplied by 4. I would have gotten this problem wrong. Okay, so that has to be multiplied by 4 here. So really, if I flip this over, isn't that 16 in front? Is that wasn't that pi over wasn't that pi over four? 
So if you flip that over, you're going to get 16 over pi. Ooh, that's all right. All right, so I'm I'm still working on this. So let's see here. If I what am I plugging in two here? So let's just plug in. Oh, uh, I suppose zero won't be too bad. To plug in. Um, so if I plug in two here. Oof, ah, interesting. Any answers yet? Yep, I got an answer. Okay, what'd you get? 16 over pi minus 16 over 3 plus 4. I didn't reduce it into one fraction. Right, right, right. So you didn't plug in the 0 then, right? Yep, but, that's exactly what I had when I plugged in the 2. Yeah, if you plug in the 0... The 0 is just... Right. That just all crosses out, doesn't it? Right, yeah, the 0 is just all 0. Yeah. Right, because sine is 0 is 0, 16 times 0, so that's going to be 0 minus 0 plus, yeah. So, yes, I agree with you 100%. Very nice. Awesome. Okay. You could get a problem like that on an AP test where you have to be able to take the integral of a problem like that. All right, so now let's get rid of this. Part B says, right, but do not evaluate. Oh, I love it when it says that. Right, but do not evaluate an integral expression that gives the volume of the solid generated when r is rotated about the horizontal line y is equal to 4. All right, so horizontal line, it's going to look like this. If my marker was working, it would look much better. Okay, did you guys watch the recorded session from last week? Yes, I did. Did you get down to the end where I had that little triangle and I asked you guys to rotate that around, you know, the x-axis, y-axis, y equals three, so all those different rotations? Yes. That is like the most important part. Awesome. So now this one I'm rotating around y is equal to four, so I'm looking at big radius. This is small radius here. This is big radius here. So now I've got pi integral 0 to 2. Now my big radius is going to be, what is that, 4 minus this function here. And that function is, so this is going to be 4 minus this whole thing, 2x squared minus 6x plus 4. And that is all squared, isn't it? Minus and then small radius. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to run out of space. That's going to be 4 minus, and then this function, or cosine 1 fourth pi x, and that's all square too. So that, to me, would be the formula that I would use in order to find the volume of rotation if I'm rotating that function around the equation y is equal to 4. Do you guys agree with that or disagree? Strongly agree. Strongly agree. Awesome. <laughs> now, part C, I'm going to get rid of this again. Part C, it says the region R is the base of a cell. Okay, base of a cell. That means I'm going to have to find one value of one of the figures. For the solid, each cross-section perpendicular to the x-axis is a square. Right, but do not evaluate. Okay, so one square. That's all I need. Oh, perpendicular to the x-axis. That means it goes this way, right? All right, wait. Is that perpendicular to the x-axis or is that parallel to the x-axis? I think you had it right the first time. Oh, my. I think so, too. I think I was trying to...
talk myself out of that. All right, so I've got my square here. Oops. All right, so I need one square. So isn't it going to be top function minus bottom function? So I've got the integral from 0 to 2, top function. That's 4 cosine of 1 fourth pi x uh, minus uh, 2x squared minus 6x plus 4. And that's all going to be squared because that's one side. And then it's a square, so I just have to square that whole thing. That is a pretty, pretty intense problem, especially when you think about that this is a non-calculator type of problem. It's going to take quite a bit of time to figure out all of those answers. So here is the answer key, and um, we didn't, we didn't um, solve it all the way to the end on the first part. But that was four points to come up with the area of that. Three points to come up with the equation um, for the volume of rotation when it's rotated around y is equal to. And then uh, two points for figuring out the formula for the base of the region. So it looks like looks like we got all nine points. Woo woo! Gotta love that. All right. Today we're going to deal with parametric functions. Do either of you guys know what a parametric function is? Have you dealt with parametric functions? I've taught a long time, and most, most of my classes that I've taught, even pre-calc, we never even got into parametric equations, okay? So now we're going to be dealing with parametric equations, so if you don't know what a parametric equation is, kind of, kind of tough, so let's talk about what is a parametric equation. A parametric curve or parametric equations is when you're given two functions that deal with x and y. So it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. It says, so let me, um, let me just go to an example and see if we can, uh, uh, okay, let's do this example. This example, this is a parametric equation, and your calculators have parametric mode in them, okay? So if you, if you went to your calculator and you went to mode, um, you'll see that it's usually on function, but there is a PAR, which really stands for parametrics. If you clicked on the parametric mode in your calculator and then went to Y is equal to, you'll see that, oh, I did not do what I wanted it to do. Did I not? No, I didn't go over to parametrics. All right. So if you went to um, parametrics, what will come out, um, if you go back to um, Y is equal to, you get something that looks like this, X1 t and y1 t do you guys see that in your calculator do you get that if you change it to parametrics okay so now if you wanted to graph something in parametric mode like for example this one you could put in t squared and 2t and you'll get this function on your calculator now what is it doing okay so a parametric function what it does is it takes another function. For example, if I was going to graph this thing out and I wanted to do it by hand, okay, my x value is going to be t squared. So usually when we do a chart like this, we always do um, three, x and y. So my x values are always going to be t squared and my y values are always going to be 2t. So then if I gave you a value for t, let's say I do negative 1, well, so my x value, so negative 1 squared is 1. My y value would be 2 times negative 1, which is 2. So that's a value that I would graph. If I said, okay, t is equal to 0, so t squared, that would be 0. 2 times 0, that's 0. So 0, 0 is a point on my graph. If I said, hey, let's graph 1, well, you put 1 squared in here, which is 1. 2 times 1 is 2. So what you're doing, a parametric function, is using different equations for x and y. Okay? So now, let's say I put 2 in here. 2 squared is 4. Uh, 2 times 2 is 4. Let's put 3. 3 squared is 9. 2 times 3 is 6. You guys see how I'm coming up with my values. So now, if I graph this out, okay, um, I'd have 1, 2. 
is a point. Zero, zero is a point. Four, four is a point. Nine, six is a point. So those are all values that would be on this graph. All right. So that is how you, you can graph a parametric function. I guess I did this wrong because 9, 6 would be here, so it'd be going this way. <laughs> and then graph the negatives, it would go this way. So why do we use these in calculus? Why do we need this in calculus? Because in calculus, they're going to ask you the same things that they ask you for regular equations. For example, they'll ask you, what is the slope at, let's say, this point right here. They want to know, uh, write an equation of a tangent line for the parametric function right here. Well, okay, so we need to know how to write a parametric, or we have to know how to find derivatives of parametric functions. They're also going to ask us to find the arc length of a parametric function. So those are two things that they will ask you to find from parametric functions. Now, usually you don't have to graph these things out. It really doesn't make any difference if you graph them out or not, um, but this is how you would graph a parametric function if you wanted to. You won't have to um, once you understand the calculus that goes behind it, that's it. So, but this is, this is what a parametric function is. It's just your X and Y values are equations, and then that's how you find your X value and your Y value. All right, so let's say I gave you a parametric function, okay? So it's parametrically defined like this. And I asked you to find a couple values to graph out. So you'd make up your chart and you'd, you'd I don't know, let's do, now this is a square root. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use some decent numbers because I don't wanna end up with some really crappy numbers to graph. So, okay, so zero, the square root of zero is zero. Oh, I, and then you know, y, is, uh, y is equal to t, so, that, so that's an easy one. So you can just fill in your y values real quick because it's just t. So now uh, x is, so the, four, the square root of four is two, square root of nine is three, square root of 16 is four. So this would be my graph, okay? So if I graph this out, zero, zero, Two four, three nine, four sixteen. Oh, that looks like a doesn't that look like a parabola going up? Okay. Now, I'd like you guys to plug this into your calculator. Um, go to x and put in the square root of t. Go to y and put in uh, t, and see if you do get the this graph. I don't think you're going to get this side of the parabola because when you think about it, you can't have a negative inside a radical. So it's only going to be this part of the graph. All right. So that is how you do a parametric equation. You can plug them into your calculator. You should get the same graph. Okay. So, oh, I had some more room that I could have graphed this out nicer. But, hey. All right. Now, here is the calculus for parametric formulas. It says if x and y are both differentiable functions of t, and if dx dt does not equal zero, then the derivative of a parametric function is just y prime over x prime. That's all it is, okay? So if they ask you for the derivative of a parametric function, it's just y prime over x prime. That's it. Okay, so let's take a look here. So in this problem, it says choose the alternative, the alternative that is the derivative of the function, okay? So you'll know right away if it's a parametric function because they always use t's in here, okay? So if I'm looking for the derivative here, what would it be? What would my answer be? Letter A, sine of t over one minus cosine of t. I agree with that. That would be the correct answer because it's just y prime over x prime. So take the derivative of this, gives me sine of t, 
take the derivative of x, gives me 1 minus um, cosine of t. Okay? So the calculus for parametric functions is not that difficult. How about uh, number 52? It says x is equal to cosine, the cosine to the third, and y is equal to sine to the third. Ah, this one you're going to have to do a little bit more work to get the answer. Uh -huh. All right, what is my answer to this problem? A little bit more work on this one. Got to be able to um, do a little bit of trigonometry. Letter E, negative tangent, negative tangent squared. Not 100% sure that's correct. Okay, let's, let's work it out. So y prime is going to be, what, 3 sine of x times cosine of x. x prime is going to be 3 cosine of x times negative sine. So I'm just going to put the negative out in front of here. Oh, that's going to be, sorry about that. I forgot to put my, um, so that's to the second power. That's to the second power. Okay, sorry. I, missed, I almost missed that. Um, times the sine of x, right? So now it looks like sine squared and cosine squared is going to be what? Weight B? <laughs> okay. So here, if you have sine, well, what I would do is I would simplify. I've got a sine x here sine squared x here, so that's going to leave me with one sine on top, right? I have a cosine here and cosine squared here, so that's going to leave me with a cosine on bottom. So now I've simplified. How about the threes? I can cross those out, but I'm still left with a negative. So I'm left with negative sine over cosine. I'm going to go negative tangent for that one. I'm going to go letter D for that. Henry, do you do you see what I did there? I kind of simplified things out, and I ended up with negative sine over cosine. And negative sine over cosine should be tangent. Okay, is that all, is that all right? I don't want to. Okay. And then if I wanted to do the last one, again, it's just y prime. So what is that going to be? 1 plus e to the negative t over or times negative 1. Okay, so I'll put a negative 1 in front of there. Or I could just write it as 1 minus e to the negative t over. And then the bottom one, so this one is going to be e to the negative t times negative 1. So this is going to just be e to the negative t. Is that just negative? Oh, that's 1 minus. Okay, I thought I could just cross out those e's, but I can't. All right, so um, I don't see, I'm not exactly sure. I got the same answer that you did, but I couldn't find a correlating letter. All right, so that means we're going to have to rewrite this. So I'm going to rewrite it as 1 over e to the negative t minus e to the negative t over e to the negative t. Okay, so this becomes e to the t, right? Minus 1. So this becomes this. Woo! My math skills are getting better. <laughs> Sometimes when I look at those problems, it's like, man, how, how do they go from one to the other? And it's like, oh, I get a common denominator. I could split that up. So, yeah. All right. Find the tangent line to the graph when t is equal to 4. Okay, so now we're talking about calculus with a um, parametric equation, right? Well, how do we find a tangent line? First of all, we need a point, right? A point and slope. So, point. What is my point? Slope. What is my slope? Those are the two things that I need. What is my point? Can you guys tell me what my point is? What is the point of this graph? 
zero, zero, disagree with that. They already told me that t is equal to four, okay? Two, four is correct, right? Because I'm just gonna plug four back in here to find my x value, so the square root of four is two. I'm gonna put four in here, well, y is equal to four, so my point is two, four. <laughs> Okay, so I've got my point. Now I need my slope. Well, guess what? To find slope, we just use the formula y prime over x prime. Well, y prime is 1. x prime, okay, well, that's t to the 1 half. So that's going to be 1 half t to the negative 1 half, which is 1 over, uh, I'm going to flip this up and make that a 2. And then this is uh, going to end up being, oh, that's going to go up to the top, isn't it? So isn't that going to be 2 squared of t here? Is that right? Did I rewrite that right? 2 squared of t? I think so. And then if I put 4 in here, uh, square root of 4 is, so my slope is 4. Now, doesn't that kind of make sense? Because we already graphed that out, and it was a parabola that looked like this. At 2, 4, slope is 4. That, to me, sounds about right. So my equation is just going to be y minus 4 is equal to slope x minus 2. Done. So we're using, we're finding the same things regardless, you know, just because it's a parametric equation doesn't change the way we do things. If they want a tangent line, we still have to find point, we still have to find slope. Well, point, we just plug the number in gives us our point. Slope, we're still taking a derivative to find the tangent. So nothing changes just because it's a parametric equation. That's why I said, even if you didn't know what parametric equations were and you didn't know how to graph them out, it makes no difference. The calculus, the math is still the same, regardless if you know what the graph looks like or not. All right, now to find the length of a parametric curve. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. So um, let L be the length of a parametric curve that is traversed exactly once as T increases from T1 to T2. Now, you cannot do these problems without a calculator. I mean, you could try, but there's no way you're going to do it. So the function or the integral, the length is just the integral from T1 to T2 of the square root of X prime squared plus y prime squared. So I usually just write it out this way. Um, we'll go t1 to t2, and then the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared. That's it, okay? okay? So if I was going to find, let's see if we have an example here. We probably will. It says find the length of the curve defined by x equals sine of t, y is equal to cosine of t, between 0 and 2 pi. All right. Now, I, I would not want to graph this out. Now, if I have a calculator, not too bad. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to graph this on my calculator to see what it looks like. Okay, so my first function is sine of t. Okay, and let's see here. So I've got sine of t. My second function is cosine of t. And I hope you guys are graphing this out, too, to see if your calculators will graph it correctly. Okay, so I'm graphing, I'm graphing. I bet you I'm going to have to put this in a different mode because I'm not seeing anything. And that usually tells me that my mode is not right. Oops. Ah. <laughs> I have a TI-83. It's going really slow. It's not graphing. I'm not seeing anything on my graph. I, and I can't change, I can't even turn it off because it's still running. Did either of you guys, it's a circle? You guys got a circle? What's the radius of that circle? One? I, oh man, mine is still graphing. It's not. Uh, come on, turn off, man. All right. I'm going to have to um, go with what you guys, um, oh, there it goes. So I, I'm going to go to radians and see if that gives me a better graph here. Oh, my goodness. My calculator is, like, in slow motion. It's barely 
holy, wow. All right, so I'm going to go with what you said. I'm going to go with that it's a radius of 1. So if it's a radius of 1, tell me what the arc length is. Before we even use calculus, if this is a circle, you should be able to tell me what the arc length is, right? What is the arc length? Because it's going from 0 to 2 pi, so that means it's going to go all the way around the circle. Isn't circumference equal to 2 pi r? So isn't it 2 pi? Isn't circumference? I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, yeah, yeah. So you do the negative and the positive side? Yeah, because if you take a look at your graph, wasn't it? Oh, mine finally finished. <laughs> Didn't it go all the way around? Yes, yes. Okay. So I am saying that, yeah, we're going to have to go the whole circle. So my answer should be 2 pi, which if we work that out, what is that going to be? 6.28 or something like that? Because when we use our calculator, we're going to end up, this is just going to be, oops, just going to be 2 times um, 3.14. So we're going to use our calculator now, to, or the formula, to see if we get the same answer. All right? Well, what was the formula? The formula was... T1 to T2, so that's two, 0 to 2 pi. And this is going to be the square root of, um, well, sine. The derivative of sine is cosine squared plus um, the derivative. It doesn't really matter how you do it, right? X or Y, it makes no difference. So that's going to be negative sine of X squared. Now, as I said, my calculator took like two minutes to graph out this thing, so I'm not really confident that it's gonna it's gonna graph this any or find the derivative any faster. So you guys plug this into your calculator. What do you get for an answer? And hopefully, it's pretty close to six point two eight. Because if it is, then we kind of just showed that the formula does work. Is it a negative sine of x? Uh, well, we took the derivative of cosine, and isn't the derivative of cosine negative sine? Yes, okay, agreed. I'm letting you guys do it on your calculators because, as I said, <laughs> my calculator would take all afternoon to get the right answer. All right, so it does work. Awesome. So the, the formula for finding, so now with a parametric equation, you should be able to find tangent line, should be able to find the slope at any given point. You should be able to find the, the arc length. So how are they going to give this to you on a AP test? Okay, here's the answer. So there it is. So here's a type of problem that you would get on an AP test. It says a particle moves in the xy plane so that the position of the particle at any time t is given by. Right away, you should be able to tell that this is a parametric equation because they're telling you that x of t is equal to this, y of t is equal to this. Okay. So whew, let's take a look at these problems. It says a find dy dx in terms of t and then find the limit as t approaches infinity of dy dx. Interesting. So we want to find the derivative first. Well, the derivative of that function shouldn't be too hard, should it? I mean, it's not, it's not the easiest problem to do. But uh, let's see here. If I take the derivative of, so y prime is going to be, oh, yeah, yeah. 
uh, e to the 3t times 3, so isn't that 9e to the 3t? Minus, uh, and then that's going to be a negative times, uh, so that's going to make it a plus. So isn't that going to be 2e to the 2t? And then x prime is going to be, uh, uh, was that going to be 6e to the 3t? Plus, no, it's going to be minus now. <laughs> it's going to be a minus sign down here. Uh, minus uh, e, uh, 7e to the 7t. All right. Is that the derivative that you guys got? Okay. All right. Now, what is the limit as t goes to infinity? Ah. What is the limit? Okay, that's a pretty that's a pretty impressive question. It's a pretty impressive equation, right? But do you remember how to come up with the limit as it goes to infinity? What's my answer? It would be approaching infinity because the negative seven the e to the negative seven t would be on the top, the numerator, and since that is the largest exponent, then it would be approaching infinity, right? I, um, well, I disagree. I think, because this is a minus, so this is just going to subtract things off, right? This is a positive, so to me, this is going to be my largest value on top and bottom, so this is going to affect the graph the most. I'm going to say that my, and this is, this is, I'm just thinking out loud here. I think the answer is 9 sixths or 3 halves. But you're right. That is the largest power there. Uh, well, I have isn't the answer. That, okay. Go ahead. Isn't the, the 7 T the largest power, though? I know. The mm. the largest power rule only applies when the base is the um, the variable. So when it's x to the seventh power, that's when you use the power rule of the largest variable because it doesn't matter. But when the when the when the variable is in the exponent, I think it I think there's a different rule that comes into play. I just that's, that's well, they'll do the same thing because if it's seven times mm -hmm. if p equals three. You have 20, e to the 21st power with the no, 7. But then you have, then you have, then you have a... Um... All right. Here is, here is the answer. And it's 3 halves. Who, who was right? Hmm, I think it was Mr. Chang was right. Um, now, why? You can't, you can't bring... Oh, did I not have a negative 7 on there? Did I just have a positive 7t? No, it was a negative 7t. Okay, so this would be the highest power, and this would be the highest power, correct? On top and bottom? You can't move this to the top because it's attached to the bottom, isn't it? This is this. You can't say, oh, I'm just going to move this to the top because that's a minus there. It's a term. You can't move terms up and down. So this would be the largest power on top. This would be the largest power on bottom. Yeah, 9 over 6, 3 over 2. Booyah. Yes. So, I mean, we could have overthought that, pro that problem a lot, but in reality, it was just the highest power on top, highest power on bottom kind of problem. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, so if it was times e to the negative 7t you could move it but you can't yes. move it because it's a plus or minus exactly so if you had if you had something like if you had two uh x to the negative second power that negative two goes to the x so you could bring that up and you could rewrite this as x to the second over two now if you had something on the bottom that was like two plus x to the negative two there's no way you can move this to the top this is you have to move the whole thing or nothing when there's plus and minus signs in between there. When it's multiplication, sure, now you can. Now I can just take this and move it to the top. But that plus sign says, no, you cannot. 
Okay, so you gotta you gotta make sure you watch that rule. All right, now um, part D it says find each value of t for which the the line tangent to the path of the particle is horizontal, or explain why none exists. Okay, well when when do we have a horizontal tangent? Okay, when is there a horizontal tangent? We need when to. What? The derivative equal to zero. Yes, the derivative is equal to zero. I agree with that. So now, if I had, um, I forgot what my derivative was. I think it was, uh, let's see here. So I have y prime is equal to uh, 9e to the 3t plus 2e to the negative 2t. And on the bottom, I think I had e, and I better redo this, so it's going to be 9, nope, uh, it's going to be 6 e to the 3t plus, and that was a negative, um, 2, uh, two. I'm on the wrong, I'm looking at the wrong problem when I'm doing this, so that's wrong, so that's going to be negative 7 e to the negative 7t, all right, so we want to find out where this is equal to 0. All right, so tell me how you do that problem. How does it does it matter what the denominator is? Because really, we want to set this equal to zero, don't we? So if we multiply this over to this side, don't I just end up with nine e to the three t plus two e to the negative two t? is equal to zero. And then I still have to solve this thing. So I'm gonna bring that two e over. So I've got nine e to the three t is equal to negative two e to the negative two t. Whew, now what? Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll bring my e to the three t over here. So that's, and then I'll bring the negative two over here. So I end up with nine over negative two is equal to e to the negative 2t over e to the 3t. And then I now I can bring that e to the 3t up, so I get this, e to the 5t. No, e to the negative 5t. That's impossible, isn't it? Because can this ever be negative? I mean, I don't care if that's a negative 5t there, but there's no way that can ever be negative. So it's never equal to zero? Right, exactly. There, It doesn't exist. Then, part D. I don't even know where part A went. What was part? There's no part A. Huh, I must have not copied that down. All right, part D, it says, Find each value of t at which the line tangent to the path of the particle is vertical or explain why it doesn't exist. Okay, so how do we find when it's vertical, when there's a vertical line? Okay. And isn't that when the, where the derivative is infinity? Where what? When the derivative is infinite. Or doesn't exist. Uh, I'm going to say because it says the line tangent to the path of the particle is vertical. Doesn't that mean the denominator would have to be zero? Because wherever the denominator is zero, don't you get a vertical tangent line? Ah, uh, yeah. So I'm just going to say, oh, okay. So I've got six e to the three t. Um, what is it? Minus seven e to the negative seven t. If I set that equal to zero. Bring that over, so I've got 6e to the 3t is equal to 7e to the negative 7t. <laughs> Again, it's going to be one of these crazy, I'm just going to bring the 7 over here. I'm going to bring the e to the 7t over here. So I'm left with 6 over 7 is equal to... Uh, Mr. Shanklin, that should be... Yeah, that's a 3. Yep. Yeah. That's a 3, right? Okay. So now, what is that? Uh, e to the negative 10t? Hey, 
okay, now, now I'm going to use logarithms, so I'm going to rewrite this as the log base e of 6 sevenths is equal to negative 10t. And then t is equal to all of this divided by negative 10. And I don't have a calculator. <laughs> so um, that, would, that would be my answer. I would just leave it like that unless this was a calculator-based problem, and then I would be able to plug it in. So let's see what they have for answers here. So this is part B. Uh, we came up with, we, we were able to take the derivative, came up with three halves. That's two points. I, I don't know what I did with part A. Huh, interesting. Um, part C, uh, we ended up with non, does not exist, two points. And part D, we ended up with 1 over 10, which is in a natural log of 7 over 6 divided by 10. So, boom. Kind of, a, kind of an interesting problem. That was probably the hardest parametric equation problem I could find. I couldn't find anything any harder than that. So parametric equations, not that difficult. I mean, most of, most of the times it's just, you know, you just have to remember the formulas. And the two formulas we have, the derivative is y prime over x prime. And the parametric curve is just the integral from t1 to t2 of the square root of uh, x prime squared plus y prime squared. That's it. Boom. Done. Phew. That was it for today. Any questions on any of that? All right. This week should be too bad. Next week, I think we deal with polar curves, which is a little bit crazier. And remember, or make sure you bring your calculator, because wherever you went to put in parametric curves, next week we're going to be dealing with polar curves. Your calculator also does polar curves. And we'll talk about that a little bit next week, graphing a polar function out. All right. You guys have a great week. Now that we're now that they canceled the snowstorm down here in the southern part of the state, I am excited because I was not looking forward to a lot of snow. But um, no snow now. Yay. <laughs> All right. Have a good week, guys. Bye.